Hi everyone, my name is Jenny and I'm back today to do another video. Today I'm going to be doing my review and discussion for my September pick for my African Women Writers Reading Project, which was She Would Be King by Way to More. If you are unfamiliar with this reading project, I will put a link to my announcement video up in the cards above as well as in the description box below. I will also put a link to my most recent review and discussion video for my August pick, which was Home Going by Ya Jossie. Additionally, I just want to remind everyone, in case you are following along with this project, that my October pick is going to be Out of Darkness Shining Light by Patina Gappa, which which is a historical fiction novel, as all of these picks are, that is set in southern Africa during the 1850s and follows the true story of the African men and women who carried Dr. David Livingstone's body out of Africa after his death. So super excited about this one. We'll be reviewing and discussing this one at some point during the middle of October. Now moving back to She Would Be King. So She Would Be King is Wayo Tumor's debut novel that was first published by Grey Wolf Press in 2018. If you're unfamiliar with Grey Wolf Press, I would highly recommend checking them out. They're a phenomenal independent publisher here in the United States based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and they have a lot of great titles in their catalog. For a short background on Wayo Tumor, Moore was born in Liberia but left Liberia as a child due to the Liberian Civil War, which began in the late 1980s and continued through the 1990s, during which time, as her family was escaping Liberia, her parents told her and her siblings many stories with more fantastical, speculative, supernatural elements to them to explain what was happening to their country, which more attributes in large part to some of the inspiration for this debut novel. After leaving Liberia, Moore arrived in Texas here in the United States, and she spent the rest of her childhood and teen years there before attending New York University's Tisch School of Fine Arts and then transferring to Howard University where she studied journalism. She also has two graduate degrees, the first of which is an MFA from the University of Southern California, and she also has a master's in anthropology and education from Columbia University. Finally, her second published work, a memoir titled The Dragons, the Giant, the Women, came out earlier this year also from Grey Wolf Press, and it is something that I'm very much looking forward to. So for a brief synopsis of She Would Be King, as Moore writes in her acknowledgments, She Would Be King tells the story of a chapter in the founding of the country of Liberia during the 1840s and moving into the 1850s. In this novel we follow our three main characters, all of whom have some sort of magical or supernatural gift that allows them some kind of supernatural resilient abilities, much of which can be understood as a metaphor I believe for resilience etc which I will talk about more in a later part of this video. Our three main characters include Besa, who is a Vai woman, which is an indigenous group native to the region in which Liberia is now a part of in West Africa, who early on in her life is declared a witch by her village. We also follow June Day, who is a man born into slavery in the United States in the state of Virginia, but who flees the plantation after his mother or maternal figure is sold to a new plantation after his plantation goes bankrupt. And then finally, we follow Norman, who is a half white man born out of rape. His mother there was a Jamaican Maroon woman, which is a group that was living within Jamaica that were a group of freed slaves who lived in the kind of mountainous regions of Jamaica and are now considered kind of a historical ethnic group. And then Norman's father was a British early anthropologist almost, although I don't believe at this time anthropology was considered an academic discipline, but he was more of a kind of governmental figure, but was very interested in the culture of the Jamaican Maroons. The narratives of these three characters all intersect as they, all three characters slowly make their way to Monrovia, which is a settlement by the American Colonization Society, I will hereby refer to it as ACS, and which later becomes the capital of the country of Liberia. So with that synopsis, let's just jump right into my guiding questions. So question number one is what are the overall themes of the novel? This novel touches on a lot of important themes. I think there's a lot to unpack here in this novel, but the strongest themes that I found were a theme of resilience, freedom, fate, and also a discussion of power and power's ability to change from the powerless to the powerful. So in terms of resilience, as I mentioned previously, all three of our characters all possess some supernatural or magical gifts, all of which relate in some way to invincibility and in some cases immortality, as our main character, Bessa, does have a gift of life in that she cannot die no matter what happens to her. And for all three of our main characters, their supernatural abilities allow them to maintain resilience and strength during times of particular hardship, um, both when we see them individually, but also as we see them as a collective. 
Additionally, we also see a theme of freedom, which is related to these ideas of supernatural abilities and resilience, and also a discussion of what it means to be free and who freedom is for. So in the second half of the novel, as I mentioned previously, a number of the characters have settled in the free colony created by the ACS, which was a group founded in America during the early 1840s as a potential avenue away from the comings of the Civil War, which obviously failed. The Civil War did happen. But it was an idea to send enslaved people from America back to Africa into a free colony and have the formerly enslaved people live as free people back in Africa. So it had a lot of colonial mindsets, very intriguing ideas to unpack there. But the discussion that many of the characters who have been sent to live in the free colony have about freedom and about privilege are very fascinating and super, I think, relevant to the kind of greater points that Moore is making in this novel, because there is quite a pushback in terms of many of them discussing their freedom and how incredible it is to be free, but then turning around and subjugating the indigenous people that were in the region prior to the arrival of the ACS colony. So there's a lot of discussion there in terms of who gets power and who gets freedom and who gets to decide who is free and are we free if not all of us experience freedom. Finally, there was a lot of discussion around ideas of fate and characters coming together in meaningful ways. However, I'm going to be perfectly honest, this aspect of the kind of thematic explorations of this novel were done through an omniscient first person narrator who would enter and leave the story throughout the novel. And I'm not entirely sure what her greater purpose was. I would love to hear others thoughts if you have read this novel and how those ideas of fate play into kind of the larger discussion that this novel is having. Question number two is how is colonialism discussed in the novel? What role does it have in the narrative? So similarly to Homegoing, which I discussed last month and which in my mind does not directly discuss colonialism, it kind of weaves itself around colonialism and talks about the effects of the pre-colonial period and colonialism in terms of American slavery and the post-colonial period, but doesn't directly discuss kind of colonialism as we traditionally discuss it kind of in the academic world of like European powers taking over another region of what is now the global south and exerting kind of very direct control. That is something that's not discussed in this novel in large part because Liberia was never a colony as we traditionally see it. So Liberia was founded as a place for free blacks from America to live in Africa. So it was never colonized by the British or the French. Obviously the indigenous groups living in this part of West Africa were colonized in some way given that the ACS brought and gave wealth to a group of free black people to help them set up their society in the same region that the indigenous groups were living. But it's not the kind of traditional ways that we think of colonialism, if that makes sense. So as I mentioned in the previous question, this whole kind of dynamic discussion of what does colonialism mean and the nuances of colonialism and what truly counts as colonialism is something that more touches on quite intensely in this novel, given that many of the characters, including our main character Bessa herself, who, as I said previously, is an indigenous woman to this region of West Africa, are subjugated and are treated as housemaids and house help and gardeners, etc. Basically are enslaved people to the free black people living in the ACS colony that later becomes Liberia, there's a lot of discussion about privilege and power and the transition of power from a group of powerless people that then become a group of powerful people. And basically, in short, just the idea that power corrupts and that power makes people think differently about the ways in which they may also be using power to the detriment of others. So I thought that whole discussion of the kind of dichotomy of colonialism and power not necessarily being a racial dichotomy, but instead being a dichotomy of wealth and class was really thought provoking and fascinating and definitely something that I took away in terms of this novel that I think is unique of some of the other novels that I've read thus far for this project. Additionally, this book does touch on some more traditionally understood ideas of colonialism, particularly through Norman's narrative, because as I said, his father was a British colonizer in Jamaica. So we do see some of the kind of effects of colonialism on the people of Jamaica, as well as the Maroons, who are obviously not native to Jamaica, but are obviously subjugated by the British colonial government in Jamaica. So that part did come through in terms of a discussion of more traditional colonialism as we've seen it kind of discussed more broadly in this project. 
moving on to question number three how are women featured in the narrative are they the main characters are they side characters so women play quite a large role in this novel particularly in the first section where we follow and meet the three main characters as each section begins with the character's mother and their birth and we get a fair amount of background on the character's mother's background and her life and kind of her struggles and her striving towards resiliency which is particularly palpable given that most of the mothers although there is one exception do not have any supernatural abilities they just are resilient in other ways and so i do think the kind of metaphorical analysis of the supernatural abilities and its connections towards resiliency and strength and not giving up hope i think is particularly true within the earlier sections of the novel where we get to see the mothers striving towards freedom and not having a supernatural ability that helps them do so. Additionally, what I also found super fascinating about this novel in particular is its discussion explicitly on the page of birth control methods of the time as well as abortion practices. So obviously throughout history, abortions have been something that happens, whether they have been done safely and legally is kind of a different question. They've happened regardless throughout history. And so seeing that on the page, particularly in the context of a plantation and the trauma that that can cause in addition to the trauma of being enslaved for enslaved women I thought was super fascinating that Moore decided to incorporate those elements into this novel and it's definitely something that I've not seen a lot in historical fiction that I've read but I do find to be a very important aspect of historical fiction when we are thinking about the post-colonial literature and subaltern literature and discussing how women's narratives and how the struggles of women can continue to be uncovered and how we can make more explicit the kind of traumas dealt to women over the course of history. One character does have an abortion uh, that was forced upon her explicitly on the page and then another character I believe it was alluded to that she had an abortion but I may be getting that wrong but I did find that to be a really fascinating and important discussion that more brought to this novel. Next up we have question number four which is how is history particularly the history of families discussed and for this novel I do think it's interesting because I think the discussion of history in this book felt much wider in scope than some of the previous novels and there's not really a sense of a history of families and families kind of connecting us through history as much as we've seen in some of the previous works for this project so that may in part be due to the fact that many of these characters do not really have a family to speak of outside of their immediate parentage and often even then they don't really know their parentage and so there's not a huge discussion on values and culture and history being passed through families as much as there is an examination of what is history more broadly and what can we learn from history and how can we rethink historical events to incorporate a more wider scope of the people involved and the kind of impacts of the events that happened. So it's kind of much more a broader post-colonial look at history and less so an individualized like family-centric look at history which I thought was interesting given that that's somewhat different than some of the other books that I've read for this project. So then moving on to question number five what were my overall thoughts on the novel? I really enjoyed this novel quite a lot. I think Moore is a brilliant talent. She is a fantastic writer, very lyrical in her prose and I think what she was undertaking here is quite impressive especially for a debut novel. I will say there were a couple things that I kind of wish had been explored a bit more. In all honesty, I think this novel could have been longer and still have been just as good, if not even better, especially that I do feel that at times I felt removed from the narrative, particularly when we were following June Day and Norman, as I think their plot lines and their characters were not quite as fully developed as Besa was. Granted, Besa is kind of our main character, particularly as we move into the second half of the novel, so it makes sense that she's the most developed, but I did kind of want more of Norman and June Day's story, and I also wish it had tied just slightly more fluidly and seamlessly to Besa's story as they all come together for a second time right at the very end of the novel like within the last five pages and I kind of wish that that had been explored a bit more and I think had that last five pages been expanded into like 20-30 pages I think would have potentially been really interesting and 
solidified even more of the themes that Moore was exploring in this novel. That all being said, however, I did still really enjoy it and I am very much looking forward to Moore's memoir as I do think she would be able to capture the memoir genre in a way that's really thought-provoking and interesting. So I ended up giving this book four stars, would really highly recommend it, especially if post-colonial history and reimagining colonial history is something that is of interest to you. I have seen some reviews that said the kind of magical realism aspects were not people's favorites, but I found them to be really engaging and I think when looking at them purely as metaphor, I think are very powerful. So that is all of my thoughts on She Would Be King by Way Two More. If you have read this novel, I would love to have a discussion about it in the comment section below. If you are now interested in reading it, I would also love to hear your thoughts and kind of what is drawing you to this story down below. And if you have found my channel through this video, I'd love to have you subscribe. But before you go, I also wanted to give an update for my kind of side reading project that I'm doing alongside these novels, which is reading through Margaret Busby's New Daughters of Africa, which is an anthology edited by Busby that I'm really enjoying. I'm about halfway through and have been reading this steadily for the past, I think about three months and we will probably be reading it through December. I definitely will be finishing this before the end of the year, but I definitely will be reading it for several more months. So I just wanted to kind of point out a few of the authors that I have really enjoyed reading in the last like 300 or so pages since I last updated you. Many of the authors that are featured in here are more so nonfiction journalists or politicians and so a lot of them don't have kind of works that you could later read about. They are more kind of just figures that you may be interested in learning more about. So I have specified the ones that I'm about to mention as novelists or short story writers or poets who you can find kind of further works on if any of these people are people that sound interesting to you. Several of the people that I'm about to mention I also have vaguely heard about but after reading their entry in this collection I definitely want to check out more of their work. So the first author that is one that I definitely plan on exploring more is Elizabeth Nunez who's originally from Trinidad but currently lives in the United States and moved here shortly after high school. I heard about her a fair bit during the Caribbean, but I've never read anything by her and I definitely want to check her out in the future. The next author is one that I have heard of who is Andrea Levy who is a British author of Jamaican descent. I know she has a novel Small Island that I believe won the Women's Prize way back in the early 2000s that I'm intrigued about and there was an excerpt of Small Island here in this anthology. The next novelist that I am interested in exploring more of is Ellen Banda Aku who was born in Zambia and she currently moves back and forth between Zambia and the United Kingdom. She has written several novels and also won the Commonwealth short story competition so I believe she also has a short story collection out. Next up is Mallory Blackman who is a black British author primarily of children's fiction although she does write some adult fiction. I believe I've also heard about her from some British booktubers but I don't believe she's very popular here in the United States so I've not heard much about her in terms of the American market. Additionally we also have Yvette Edwards who's also a black British author. Uh, Margaret Busby herself is currently lives in the UK and so it is somewhat UK focused but there's definitely a lot of American authors in this collection as well. Speaking of another United Kingdom based author we have Amnata Forna who was born in Scotland but then moved back to Sierra Leone and then returned to the United Kingdom where she now lives. Her 2018 novel Happiness was a finalist for the booktube prize last year and I meant to rate it but then I never did so I will probably get on that very soon because I am very intrigued about her work. We also had Nalo Hopkinson who I've actually read before but I definitely want to read more of in the near future who's a Jamaican born Canadian citizen so she currently lives in Canada and I believe she's lived there for much of her life but she has Jamaican ancestry and she writes more kind of speculative fiction which is exciting. And then another person that was super relevant to my interest and I definitely will be looking her up more in the future is Leslie Loco who is a writer and architect who currently lives in Johannesburg South Africa but she has Ghanaian and Scottish ancestry so I thought that was very fascinating as well and her entry was very interesting. And then last but not least we have a Barbadian author so another Caribbean author Karen Lord who also writes speculative fiction and I believe she I have heard about from Injury at Onyx Pages who if you've not checked out her channel and you read any speculative fiction would highly recommend checking her out. I'll put a link to her channel in the description box below. She also loves Nala Hopkinson and yeah I think those are all of the entries that I kind of wanted to point out as authors that I will hopefully be checking out at some point in the near future. 
and I think that is everything. Thank you so much if you've watched this until the very end and I hope you have a, a great rest of your day whenever you're watching this and I will talk to you next time. Bye!